What's up everyone? Welcome to the Megami Tensei video games tier list. About three years ago, I uploaded a video on this channel where I ranked pretty much every Megaton game I had played in a tier maker tier list. I figured since half of YouTube was doing it with whatever niche or gaming franchise their channel was focused on, I might as well jump on the bandwagon since I'm a Megaton focused channel. Now, recently a lot of people have been asking me where I would rank some of the more recent games like Shin Megami Tensei 5 and Soul Hackers 2, so I figured that rather than respond to everyone individually, it would be better if I just went back and remade that video. Not only so that I can include those games, but also because a lot of the games I talked about in that video I had not played in years. And since then I've had a chance to go back and replay some of them, and my opinions on some of those games has changed quite a bit. Now, I should point out that for games with remasters and re-releases, I just included the most recent versions because I don't really see that much of a reason to go back to these games in their original forms, unless it's for, like, nostalgia or you just don't own the most recent platform, with the only exception being Persona 3 Portable and Persona 3 FES for reasons you'll find out later in the video. And also, just keep in mind that this video is just my opinion. I don't look down upon anyone who disagrees. In fact, I actually encourage you all to make your own tier list using the link down below in the description. And also keep in mind that just because a game places low, that doesn't mean I think it's a bad game. I just think it's not quite as good as the ones above it. There's really only one Mega 10 game that I think is bad, which you'll find out soon enough. And lastly, before we start, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Yahaha. Yahaha is a brand new, state-of-the-art platform for developing your very own 3D interactive multiplayer experience. Now, while that may sound like something with a steep learning curve, no prior knowledge of coding is actually required. Yahaha is extremely user-friendly, and with it, you can easily create your own unique experiences by selecting from any of the millions of different ready-to-use assets from the cloud drive. And once you're done, you can publish it to the app, where others can check it out from either their smartphones or Windows PCs. And you can also check out other people's creations by joining them yourself. Whatever the case is, you're never going to be bored with Yahaha. It truly is a platform with unlimited possibilities and things to do. Yahaha is currently still in early access, but if you use the link down below in the description, you can join in on the fun and get started with your very own platform right now for free. And check out the dozens of already existing user creations just to get an idea of what you'll be able to do with this platform. I want to give a big shout out to Yahaha for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get back to the video. Alright, let's get started, and I'll start by getting pretty much all the games in the not yet played category out of the way, which is pretty much just games that never got released outside Japan and still don't have English fan translations. Pretty much, you know, most of the Devil Children spinoffs. I mean, I'll be honest, some of these games do look kind of interesting, but they're Devil Children, so I don't imagine there's much of a demand for fan translations. Devil Summoner is probably the game I want to see in English the most, and there is a fan translation in the works, but, you know, fan translations, we could get it in a year. Or 20. And I also know some of the last Bible games are available in English. I still need to get around to those. I mean, I wasn't a, the biggest fan of the first one, but they are on my radar and I will get to them soon enough. But now that's out of the way, let's move on to the ones I have played. And I will start with none other than SMT Nocturne. And I think this game can go in... Pretty sure it was an A in my last video. I actually think I'm going to bump it up to the S tier. You know, this is one of those games that I just find myself appreciating more and more the more I play it. The combat is just so much fun, the dungeon design is excellent, the music is god tier, and honestly the story and characters also grow on me the more I play, and I think the reasons are done very well. Nocturne is just a timeless classic, and I cannot recommend it to you all enough. Up next, I might as well start by getting the other main lines out of the way, and I will do SMT4 next. And I think you can go in the A tier. I know this game is held in extremely high regards by a lot of people, and while I do think it is a great game because of its combat and exploration, I do think it has some problems, particularly the story is a little on the weaker side. It has some gameplay issues, like I'm not a big fan of the spurking system. I really hate how lazy they got with demon stat distributions. And don't even get me started on the alignments and endings. But I will say the characters for this game are really strong, and there's just so much to do. 
I find myself always finding something new every time I go back to this game, and not to mention it looks amazing. The fact that they were able to get this game to run and look as good as it does for such an early 3DS game itself is an accomplishment, and it's one of the reasons this game is an A tier. Now as for Apocalypse, this is very much a love it or hate it game, and personally, I'm a little more on the love it side. This game comes under fire a lot for its story and characters, which I will not defend, but I do think it has an interesting premise, particularly with the way it handles the whole war with angels and demons and the divine powers and whatnot. But the reason I put it in A is because of its gameplay, which is an improvement over SMT4 in pretty much every way. It gave demons unique stat distributions, finally, they fixed smirking, and they added the skill affinity system, which I love. Apocalypse may not be without its issues, but if you can appreciate this game for what it did right, you may just be in for a good deal of enjoyment with it. Now on to SMT5, and... Originally, originally I was going to put it in A, but honestly, I think SMT5 is worthy of the S tier. I mean, this game is pretty much an improvement over Apocalypse in every way. The story is a bit lacking, but again, it has an interesting premise with some great combat, great artwork, and I absolutely love the exploration, which I know a lot of people aren't big fans of, but to me, it was just so much fun exploring the ruins of post-apocalyptic Tokyo, and the music is probably my favorite of all the main lines, and it's one of the reasons I think it deserves to be an S tier. Oh, and while I'm at it, let me just get SMT1, SMT2, and pretty much all the mainline SMT games on the Super Famicom, including Kyuyaku, out of the way. I think I was a little hard on these games in my last video. In that video, I called them outdated, but I don't really think that's the right term. I'd say they're more just bare bones, and honestly, these games were ahead of their time in many ways. I think the combat still holds up, the stories are great, and the music is good too but they're really held back by the terrible navigation, and even for the Super Famicom, they don't look that good. Still, these games were some of the first of their kind, and without them, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the other games on here, and I think that alone says something. And I also might as well rank Majin Tensei while I'm at it, both Majin Tensei 1 and Majin Tensei 2, which are also going to be... Oh, what happened to it? Oh, did I lose it? Oh, I did not mean to do that. I mean, again, these games are a little bit on the janky side, but the gameplay is still fun with awesome music and pretty good stories. These games are SRPGs, which is something that the Mega Ten series had never done before. Just don't go in expecting something as good as Fire Emblem or Devil Survivor, because if you do, you're going to be a little disappointed. I will say that Majin Tensei 2 is an improvement over the original, but I wouldn't say it's enough to bump it up to a higher tier. And last, but certainly not least, we have Strange Journey. I am going to put you in the double S tier. I absolutely love Strange Journey. If you ask me, Strange Journey is a culmination of everything that makes Mainline great, and then some. The dungeon designs are just the right balance between challenging and fun, the combat is unique, strategic, and challenging, and the story is without doubt the best of all the Mainline games, with also the best characters in my opinion. It's a game that I already had a high opinion of, but again, the more I play it, the more I find myself loving it. Strange Journey is just an all-around fantastic game, and I cannot recommend it enough. Oh, and I almost forgot to include DX2 and SMT Imagine, which are both going to go in the D tier. And this is, and really this is mainly due to personal bias, I'm just not that much of a big fan of MMOs and mobile games. I found SMT Imagine largely a chore to play when I was playing Reimagine not too long ago, and for DX2, I found myself messing with the augmented reality feature probably more than I actually played the game. But I will say, I do like how DX2 is constantly being updated and giving classic demons we haven't seen in ages a chance to shine. But it is still a mobile game, and really, these games just aren't my cup of tea. Now that Mainline is out of the way, we might as well move on to Persona, starting with Persona 1. And pretty sure I put this game in B? I think Persona 1 actually deserves to be bumped up to A. While I understand some of the criticisms people have with this game, mainly with the releases, 
I do think Persona 1 doesn't get enough credit for its story, as well as its combat, which is like a pseudo-SRPG sort of thing, where battles take place on a grid, and attacks and weapons have different effective ranges, along with the fact that it's basically two games in one, with you having the option to do either the Snow Queen quest or the Sebek quest. It really makes this game stand out in a good way, in my opinion, and another reason I feel comfortable bumping it up is because something that wasn't there when I first played it, there is a patch that replaces the new PSP soundtrack with the original PS1 soundtrack. So, you're basically playing the best version of the game with the best music, and it's one of the reasons I was able to enjoy this game a lot more my second time around. Persona 1 is one of the many games that my opinion has changed on quite a lot since replaying it, and that is why I am comfortable putting Persona 1 in A. And speaking of games that my opinion has changed on, Persona 2 Innocent Sin. And it really pains me to do this, but... Guys, don't get me wrong, I love Innocent Sin. It has one of the best stories and cast of any JRPG I've ever played. But the gameplay for this game is just not good. And I say this mainly because of how painfully easy it is. If you can go through the entire game with only your starting persona and have enemies still be doing damage in the single digits to you throughout most of it on hard mode, there is something seriously wrong. Fortunately, the exact opposite is true of Eternal Punishment. And I am going to put Eternal Punishment in S tier. While the gameplay is pretty much identical to Innocent Sin, they fixed the biggest problem. They actually made the game challenging. Maybe a little too much for the PSP version, because that game's hard mode can be very brutal at times. Had I been talking about the PS1 version in this video, I'd probably put it in either B or A tier, but Recently, we've gotten a fan translation for the PSP version, which makes a number of quality of life improvements, and it makes the transition from Innocent Sin to Eternal Punishment a much smoother one. Not to mention, it also has the extremely awesome Tatsuya scenario. I won't say whether the story or cast is better than Innocent Sin's, but Eternal Punishment still has one of the best stories you can experience in a video game, and it's why I feel it's worthy of the S tier. And now we get into our good friend Persona 3, and I'm gonna start with FES, which I think belongs in A tier. This may come as a surprise because I've been pretty vocal about how I think Portable is the better version, but I still think FES gets a little too much flack from fans of Portable. The lack of the ability to control party members is definitely a problem, but this can be mitigated by using the tactics menu. A lot of people also don't like the way characters get tired exploring Tartarus, but I think this adds sort of another layer of challenge to it. Now, the story and characters of Persona 3 I think are great, and hands down, the best of the Hashino Persona games. The music is awesome, and I have a little bit of a soft spot for Tartarus, mainly because of how much of a big fan I am of roguelikes, and I actually think the answer is a nice, underrated addition too. Now, Portable on the other hand... Portable can go in... Double S. You know, I've said this a few times in this video, and I'm probably going to be saying it more, but Portable is the definitive version of Persona 3, and it's another game that I just find myself liking the more I come back to it. Again, the story and characters are very well written and relatable, and Portable streamlined the experience by adding controllable party members, skill cards, allowed you to explore Tartarus as much as you want, and made some very welcome balancing changes, like being able to attack the same turn you get back up. Best of all, they added the option to play as a female protagonist, which is a completely new experience that just adds so much to the game. You have new music, new characters, new social links, and best of all, you can play it on the go. Persona 3 is a masterpiece, and I think the best version of this awesome game more than deserves its spot in the double S tier. Now on to good old Persona 4, and I think this game is going to stay in the B tier. Again, I know a lot of people hold Persona 4 nearly and dearly, but removing my nostalgia classes, I do think Persona 4 is kind of underwhelming, especially following the success of Persona 3. I think the story is a little bit lacking, the social links aren't really all that good, although the characters are good for the most part, but not as good as the ones in Persona 3. The only thing I'd say it did better than 3 was the fact that it added controllable party members, and there's more variety with the dungeons, but 
I still can't really bring myself to put Persona 4 any higher than the B tier, and it's probably my least favorite Persona game. And now on to the one that is probably going to cause the most controversy, Persona 5. And I think I am going to put Persona 5 in the A tier. I think it was in B in the last video, but the main reason I feel comfortable bumping it up is because of the changes made in Royal. For one thing, I absolutely love Kasumi and Maruki and their new story arcs in Royal. The same goes for Akechi. The main story and characters, though, are kind of hit or miss. I mean, the music is good, but again, I think the music in Royal is ten times better. And the gameplay is fun, but it's way too easy. Although, I am a little more forgiving toward Royal than Innocent Sin, because in Innocent Sin, it was purely because the enemies were just weak. In Royal, it's more because there are just so many ways to cheese your way through dangerous situations. Persona 5 Royal is a great game, but not a masterpiece, and it's why I have it here at A. Now, before I move into Persona spinoffs, I should get some of the other spinoffs out of the way, which I will start with Soul Hackers 1. And I think I'm going to put Soul Hackers 1 in A. Soul Hackers 1 is great. It's everything that defines classic Megaton with a retro futuristic 90s cyberpunk coat of paint, along with a great story with great characters and all the charm of the Devil Summoner series. Plus, the gameplay and dungeons are really good too. I would say that this is one of the most underrated Megaton games, but because of it, we got the recent Soul Hackers 2, which is already a pretty controversial game. And speaking of. I think I am going to put Soul Hackers 2 in B. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does have some flaws, but I wouldn't say it's anywhere near as bad as the detractors are saying it is. The dungeon crawling does kind of suck, but I think the combat, music, characters, and story are pretty good. It's not that Soul Hackers 2 is bad at what it does, it's just most of what it does, other Megatens do better, and that's why I put Soul Hackers 2 at the B tier, right below Soul Hackers 1. And I guess while we're on the topic of Devil Summoner, I should also put the Rido game somewhere on here. And I think I'm going to put these games at... Um... Let's see. I think I'm going to put these games in the B tier. I will say I think that Rido 2 is slightly better than the first game, but not enough to put it a whole tier higher. These are really the only action RPGs of this style that I've actually really been able to get into, and that's mainly because of the elements brought over from SMT. Honestly, if I was more of an action RPG fan, they'd probably be higher, and even though I suck at these games, I still did have a lot of fun playing them. I think Raido is one of the coolest protagonists in all of gaming, and the story is interesting for both games. Not to mention, I absolutely love the 20s Tokyo setting, and I highly recommend these games to any Mega Ten fan. In fact, since I'm on the Golden Age Megaton games, that being the PS2 generation, let's rank the Digital Devil Saga games. And I will put Digital Devil Saga 1 in double S and Digital Devil Saga 2 in S. This may confuse some people since these games are pretty much identical in gameplay, and the story in 2 is just a continuation of the first game, which I'll get to in just a second, but right now, I just want to gush about how much I love Digital Devil Saga. The combat is pretty much a carbon copy of Nocturnes, but instead of recruiting and summoning demons, you turn into an Atma avatar, which you can customize through this skill tree system, and it is a lot of fun developing and perfecting your party this way. It has a truly unique story with an excellent cast of characters, which is not only interesting, but very thought-provoking, and it will have you hooked from start to finish. Now, the reason I put 1 above 2 is because in 2, I'm not going to spoil it by saying what happens, but your party members will rapidly come and go throughout the game. In fact, you actually spend a good chunk of the game without your main character. This means that if you've been working really hard developing a character, it's kind of a problem when they suddenly just leave the party. I know they did this for story reasons, but I do think it is enough of an issue to bump it down to S, unlike one which doesn't have this issue. Either way, I think both of these games are masterpieces and some of the most underrated games in the franchise. Now let's move on to Devil Survivor. And this is an easy one. Devil Survivor 1, 
is going in double S tier. Devil Survivor Overclocked is, in my opinion, the best game Atlas has ever made. I mean, where do I even begin? Do I start with the well-developed and relatable characters? How about the mature and realistic storyline that brings up philosophical and political questions? How about the endings or the music? How about the fun and addicting gameplay that never seems to get old no matter how much I play it? I could gush about this game all day, but I recommend you all watch my video on this game to get a better idea of why I like it so much. But for this video, Devil Survivor Overclocked gets an easy spot in the double S tier. Devil Survivor 2... Now, a lot of people seem to think that I hate this game, which I don't know why. I thought it made it pretty clear that I don't. I just don't think it's as good as the first game. I think I put it in B in my last video, but I'm actually going to bump it up to A tier. I mean, it does have its issues. I don't think the story is really all that good. It's basically just Neon Genesis Evangelion with a Megaton coat of paint. The characters are very hit or miss, where I find myself either loving them to death or not even wanting to look at them. But the main reason I bumped it up to A is because of the Triangulum arc, which was added in the 3DS version. Unlike the 8th days that they added in Overclocked, where they were pretty much just a little bit of extra content, this was almost an entirely new game. And while I absolutely hate what it did with the characters, I think the story is very interesting, and the boss battles are also really cool. I mean, yeah, sure, one of the bosses looks like a sliced kiwi and the other a cheese grater, but gameplay-wise, they are all really cool, and that really goes for all the bosses in this game. Devil Survivor 2 is a great game, just not a worthy successor to the masterpiece that was the first game, in my opinion. Alright, TMS. Oh, TMS, where do I put you? Um, I think I'm gonna put you in the C tier. I thought about B, but honestly, really the only thing about this game that stands out to me is the gameplay. Maybe if I were more of an idol fan, I'd be more into this game, but to me, it's just a poor man's digital devil saga. Some of the characters are kind of cool, like Tsubasa and Kiria, but for the most part, I found the story uninteresting. The gameplay, again, was good, but not as good as most other games, and everything outside the dungeon crawling and combat really just felt like a chore. I mean, even the dungeon crawling really wasn't all that good. And I hate to be that guy, but even if you are the most diehard fan of this game, do you really think that this was the best course of action for the highly anticipated SMT and Fire Emblem crossover. This could have easily worked as a new IP, but I guess they needed that crossover to be something, and that's what this was. I think now is a good time to get into the Persona spin-offs, starting with... Well, I might as well go in order of release, so I think I'm gonna start with Arena Ultimax, which I am gonna put in B. Now, if Ultimax and the original Arena were separate, I'd probably put the original in C with Ultimax in B, because really, the story mode for Arena is not good. Like, the story is fine and all, but it's pretty much just a visual novel, and the character stories are really only different up until the actual P1 Grand Prix starts, with Labyrinths being the only exception. Ultimax, on the other hand, is a huge improvement, and the story is fast-paced with shorter cutscenes and a lot of fun to experience. Now, the fighting is great. I mean, these games had a very strong competitive scene when they came out, but since then, it's kind of died down, which sadly could not be saved by the re-release. But I do think the arena games are very solid fighters and well worthy of being in B tier. Now, Persona Q... I think I'm gonna put you in C. Persona Q is a game that I was very excited before it launched, but really... I think this game kind of falls flat in a lot of ways. It's a first-person dungeon crawler from the makers of Etrian Odyssey, and while definitely not a bad game by any means, it can be kind of frustrating at times. The dungeon designs are very confusing, I'm really not a fan of the way you're supposed to create your own dungeon maps, and the combat, while solid, will result in you running out of MP very quickly, especially on higher difficulties and will force you to constantly backtrack to heal up. I will say the story is cool and the chibi art style is cute, the music is also really awesome, but I can't really bring myself to put this game any higher than C. Moving on to Dancing All Night, I think I'm gonna put you in C. I mean, I could go on about how ridiculous of an idea it was to make Persona into a rhythm game, but I actually think Atlas did a pretty decent job here. And as someone who's not really a fan of rhythm games, I actually enjoyed this game quite a bit. 
not only for its gameplay, but also for its story, and the new remix songs are pretty good too. Since then, I have played some other rhythm games like the Hatsune Miku Project Diva series, which I think are better, and they're the main reason that this game is only in C tier. And again, while I think those are better, for a Persona-themed rhythm game, Dancing All Night did a solid job, and I definitely think is worth checking out. The same cannot be said, however, for the 3 and 5 dancing games, which are going to go in E. Not only were these games considerably lacking in content compared to Dancing All Night, with having no story mode, they were also priced higher and had DLC that totaled 85 bucks. Plus, they also remastered Dancing All Night for PS4, but the only way you could get that was to get the $100 Collector's Edition, which had sorry excuses for bonus items. Now, I will say I have seen these games go on sale quite a few times, and I myself even got the bundle for only $20, which also included Dancing All Night, and for that price, you really can't go wrong, but I will still never forgive Atlas for thinking that they could get away with anti-consumer practices of the likes of Bethesda and EA, and it's why these games are at the bottom in E tier. Might as well get the other low-tier game out of the way, Last Bible 1 or Revelations the Demon Slayer. Yeah, I think I'm gonna put this in D. I mean, for this being one of the first Mega 10 games to be released on a handheld console as early as 1992 in Japan, Last Bible really isn't bad, but the primitive technology it's on, among some other things, do kind of hold this game back. You have to be extremely lucky to succeed in Demon Negotiation, and it's also very easy to accidentally wander into a high-level area. Not to mention, this game is pretty short, at least for Megaten standards. The story isn't anything special, although the setting is cool, and to be fair, it is one of the better RPGs on the Game Boy that's not Pokemon, but I still don't really think it holds up as well as some of the other games on here, and that's why I can only put it in D. But, getting back to Persona spinoffs, I will put Q2 in... B. There's really not a lot to say other than the fact that it's an improvement over the first game in pretty much every way, with better dungeons, better music, and a better story. And not only did it have Persona 5 characters, but it also added the female protagonist from Persona 3. The only major downside is that it was never dubbed into English, though I don't even want to imagine how much some of these voice actors would charge nowadays. Although in that case, could you have maybe gotten it out a little faster, Atlas? Well, regardless, Persona Q2 is a pretty underrated Persona spinoff, and one I definitely think is worth checking out. And last but not least, we have Persona 5 Strikers. And I think I'm going to put Strikers in... A. I mean, this game has a story that I honestly think is better than the original Persona 5, and it does a better job with the characters, as well as the main villains. The dungeons are a lot of fun to explore, and this game just had a lot going for it for a spin-off. This was the first Mega 10 action RPG in a long time, and I think Team Ninja brought that style into Persona in the best way they possibly could have, and I cannot recommend this game enough. And while not really a spin-off, Catherine, I think... Yeah, I think I could put this game in the S tier. A lot of people commented on my last video that Catherine wasn't a Mega 10 game, neither was Machin X or Shao, but... I don't know, it gives me more stuff to talk about. But anyway, Catherine is a very fun puzzle game with some of the best characters and storyline I've seen. When I played this game the first time, I was growing up in a very conservative Christian home and I thought that owning this game made me hardcore, but I didn't really come to appreciate the themes of this game until I was older. I'm not the biggest fan of the new stuff they added in full body, but I do think Rin is a good character. But whether you're playing full body on the PS4 or Catherine Classic on the PS3, Xbox 360, or PC, Catherine is an absolute masterpiece, and I cannot recommend it enough. Now, the other quote-unquote non-Mega-10 game, Machin X, which I think I will put in the C tier. I've talked about this game in another video, and yeah, for a first-person hack and slash on the Dreamcast, Machin X is a pretty great game. It's a lot of fun to go through the levels hacking and slashing, but also to actually take over the bosses you defeat and play as them. This game is pretty short, but it is very replayable, especially if you want to get some of the other endings. I also included Mock and Shao in the not played category, mainly because this game was translated into English, but it was never actually released in North America, only in Europe, which is freaking stupid. And I understand that I could emulate it very easily, but I don't know. The fact that this game is stuck in Europe is one of the main reasons that I haven't really gone anywhere near it, and also 
The original Machin X was in first person, while Shao was in third person. I don't really know why Sega felt the need to remake this game in third person rather than just port Machin X to the PS2 like they did most of their other Dreamcast games, but whatever. If you guys have played Machin Shao, you are more than welcome to rank it on here. I have not played it, but that being said, I probably will get around to it at some point. Alright, looks like we're almost done, and I got, oh, I got Demi Kids. I think I'm gonna put Demi Kids in the C tier. Demi Kids is a game that a lot of people won't go anywhere near, but, you know, Demi Kids is honestly a decent game. Believe it or not, these games were the first Mega Ten games to use the title Shin Megami Tensei in English, and I imagine Atlas saw all the success of not just Pokemon, but all the other monster collecting games on the GBA, and were like, yeah, let's bring this over. Now, these games were somewhat of a departure from the rest of the franchise, but to call them Pokemon knockoffs would be completely incorrect. I'd say they're more Mega Ten games loosely inspired by Pokemon in an attempt to be more kid-friendly, and honestly, it succeeds in doing just that. The gameplay is still fun, and very much Mega Ten, and the story is actually surprisingly dark. And while it does come in two versions, these versions are basically different games. I can completely understand why everyone might not be the biggest fan of these games, but I think they're definitely worth checking out. You just might be in for a good deal of enjoyment with Demi Kids. And finally, we have Synchronicity and Jack Bros. Synchronicity I debated even including since it was basically just a free bonus game made to celebrate the release of Redux, but eh, if I'm gonna be counting Catherine and Machin X, I might as well include Synchronicity. And I think I'm gonna put this in C tier. And Jack Bros, I think I am also going to put in C tier. Now, Jack Bros is a game that a lot of people jokingly praise as one of the best games in the series, but let's be serious here, guys. It's just an average puzzle action game. You run around dungeons, kill monsters, collect keys. It's what you'd expect from a game of its type for a portable console in the mid-90s. I will say I don't recommend hunting down a physical copy because that will probably set you back an entire paycheck or two, but for a game of its type, it's not bad. It's just an average puzzle shooter. Nothing more, nothing less. And yeah, that is every single Megami Tensei game that I have played ranked in this tier list. I imagine that, you know, maybe two or three years from now, once we get more games and my opinions on some of these other games have changed, maybe then I'll probably make another one, but... For now, this is my most recent Megami Tensei games tier list. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I'm definitely curious to hear your guys' thoughts and see your own tier list. Like I said, I have a link in the description. Be sure to check out my other links too, and consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation of just $3. Till the next video, I will see you all later.